Well, good evening. That was a very nice uh, you don't often get that from other BBC people, actually, that kind of, uh, kind of generosity. Of course, I am uh, recognized throughout uh, this country and, and indeed uh, in many other countries as the wor of, the, of, of the world as the uh, possibly the best, the greatest, the finest um, broadcaster of, of, of the lot. Because... Um, <laughs> Thank you, but uh, this is because everybody thinks uh, that I'm Sir David Attenborough, and uh, <laughs> I, uh, um, I was in Oxford. As it happens, I was in Oxford. I, ha I have nowadays a... I, it, the fact is, he's 22 years older than me, so it's not entirely a compliment. Um, I, I, had, I have nowadays a, a little um, six-year-old son who's the light of my life, as you can imagine. A sort of surprising thing for a bloke of my age, really. And um, I, I was in, in, in Oxford in Corn Market and, uh, about three years ago. So he was three. He had long golden curls, which his mother refused to cut, to my great disgust. And uh, I had him on my shoulders. And a bloke stopped me and said... Oh, Mr. Attenborough, what a beautiful granddaughter you've got. <laughs> so, what do you do? What do you do? I mean, I, you know, you can explain how you loathe animals and, and, and so on, but I, 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 I didn't do that. Actually, I just went out for a walk a moment or two before th this started, wandering around, and, uh, and somebody came up to me and said, Oh, you know, wonderful to see you, uh, Mr. Snow. So, I, <laughs> you know, this is... This is the, the, the story in a way. I mean, I think it's terribly important uh, if you do the kind of job that, that people like me do, and there's more than one of us. As you, well, you've already seen one, and there's another one coming along uh, in, in a moment, um, to realize that actually, you know, it, it, it's not about you. It's about, well, the story. It's about what you do and how you tell people about it, how you explain it to people, how you go through the thing, and how you tell them as best you possibly can what is really going on. I used to hate that notion of the story. I used to think that's a real hacks expression, you know. Why does it have to be a, a story? Why can't it be the truth? But now I realize that, well, for a start, of course, when you see the complexities of of these things, you realize that you have to select your, your pathway through them, and that involves telling a story of one kind or another. And the nature of the story that you tell, the nature of the narrative, uh, is, is uh, what is really uh, dependent on, on your understanding of what the thing is about. So therefore, telling a story is not actually just spinning a yarn, which I used to think it was, really is the most important thing that you can possibly do if you, if you go off to, uh, to these strange places. I've, I've uh, naturally, traveling around the world for a rather a long time, 46 years, not quite as long as, uh, as Sir David Attenborough, but uh, getting on that way, um, I've, of course, uh, knocked up against Oxfam um, continually. And um, the worse the place, by and large, the more likely you are to find uh, Oxfam there. The worse the, the crisis of whatever kind it may be, the more likely they are to be doing their superb job. But the thing I like about Oxfam, as opposed, I have to say this, uh, even though I won't name any names, um, uh, as compared with uh, some other outfits, is that they're not, they're not flashy. They're not, they don't boast about what they're doing. Um, they don't wear, you know, those rather irritating kind of Afghan scarves around their necks and things. It always puts me off whenever I go around. Um, they, don't, um, they, don't, they don't stay in the big five-star hotels, quotes, because they have to be near the press, close quotes, which is a jolly dodgy thing, thing to do. Um, and, of course, opens up more uh, rooms in the hotel for us, too, which is useful. Um, uh, and it, it, it's that business of that, that kind of, of calmness. And the best, I think the best uh, and most dedicated journalism has, has that. Last year, um, 
Well, I was talking to Lindsay Hilson, who's uh, a, a good colleague of mine and a good friend of mine, works for Channel 4, of course, uh, nowadays. Um, and we were talking about last year as compared with this year in terms of being busy. And uh, last year was immensely busy. I think the second um, busiest year of my entire career, uh, apart from 1989 to 1990, uh, or beginning of 1991, uh, which was even bigger. But um, I was recalling then, when she s started talking about it, I, I thought about being in Libya, for instance, being there uh, on the day that Colonel Gaddafi fell in, in August of, of, uh, of last year. And um, I remember I, I, w I was late, surprise, surprise, as ever, why change the habits of a lifetime, and uh, came puffing up uh, um, to the live, the television live point, the BBC's live point, which was near a barracks where there was a lot of fighting going on. I was amazed to find there were three or four uh, BBC people standing there, so, and one of them in front of the camera all the time, and then they were, they were sort of moving through, and there, were, uh, there was a producer and so forth, and nobody seemed to notice uh, what the first thing that I saw, which was that there was a, a rocking great tree just out of shot beside the, the live point, and it was, it was on fire. And the reason it was on fire was uh, because it, it had taken a hit from a tracer shell about 40 minutes earlier. And uh, I, I said to somebody, what was it, what's all this? Oh, yeah, it's a tracer shell. Yeah, it didn't, didn't hurt anybody. Well, that was good. Um, and I, I really admired the way that they were just plowing on with the job, not getting excited, didn't even mention the tracer, tracer shell. I think I would have found it difficult not to mention the tracer shell, especially since wafts of smoke were coming between the, uh, the camera and the, and the reporter. Um, I thought, you know, somebody's going to think that, you know, somebody who's been smoking a cigar too near the camera. But uh, in fact, nobody even, even mentioned that. And I really like that about about my profession when it's when it's good that uh, people commit themselves to what they're doing and how they do it um, and and an outfit like Oxfam believe me is the uh, is exactly similar um, it goes about its job calmly and quietly it would be of course terribly easy um, to whip up a lot of of emotion about the things that, that well, I, I sometimes see and that Oxfam sees all the time. Uh, it's not difficult to, to, to get people to weep openly in front of their television sets or in front of their, their newspapers if they're reading an advertisement. A, a, a photograph can be incredibly effective, of course. We, we know that. But the important thing is, it seems to me, that that's not the only part of the story. And sometimes, and I think this is particularly true of journalists, you get the feeling that we're kind of looking for the next thing that's going to upset people and make them feel that they've got to put their hand in their pocket and do something. Maybe we're moving away a little bit uh, from that. But I, I suspect that that's a, um, a, a kind of default uh, position that, that, that quite a lot of people have. And I suspect, or I don't have any evidence of this particularly, but I suspect it must be true uh, in, the, in the aid community as well. And I, the, the dealings that I've had with Oxfam have, have shown me that that isn't how Oxfam behaves. It's not just concerned uh, with the tear jerking. It has to deal with tear-jerking situations, but that's not what it's all about. And that's not the kind of story that I think uh, that we should always be telling, as though we're anxious to make people unhappy about their world and to feel that, uh, that things are endlessly going on, that, that in Africa as a continent is given over to, to, to hunger and misery and poverty. Uh, it isn't true, of course. I mean, anybody who travels regularly to Africa knows how many successful, certainly moderately successful states 
there are in, in, the, in the continent. How many get by uh, without anybody being hungry in the, uh, in the, in, in the entire country? I, I, I was, you know, surprise, surprise, that happens a great deal. And it's very important, I think, that we should understand that. And that, too, is part of the complexity of the story which we have to tell and which organizations like Oxfam have to tell. I was just in Afghanistan um, uh, until about two weeks ago, I think. I was, I have to admit, I was having a holiday in Afghanistan. Not an awful lot of people have holidays in, in Afghanistan. In fact, when I, uh, I, I had to get a, I, I was working there and then I had to uh, change uh, uh, my, my kind of uh, persona, as it were, and I had to go and get a, a tourist visa and come back to Afghanistan. And when I unveiled this tourist visa at the airport, the man couldn't believe it. I don't think he'd ever seen a tourist visa um, <laughs> in Afghanistan. The reason I was there was that I, I have a very good friend, a wonderful friend, an 85-year-old Italian photographer, famous, famous photographer, famous in Italy, not, not outside. And he used to travel in Afghanistan in the 60s and early 70s before things went so badly wrong and was desperate to come back. And, uh, and so I, I agreed to, to, uh, to, to take him. And we had a lovely, lovely time, a uh, difficult time sometimes. One of the people I took him to see was a man called Mohammed that I'm uh, deeply fond of, Mohammed Khan, <laughs> who is, uh, well, would like to be um, a market trader in Kabul. He must be one of the poorest people in, in the second poorest country in, in the world because he's never been able to bribe the police to allow him to get a, um, a card to, uh, to have a stall uh, in the marketplace. And so he, he uh, sells the, the, the vegetables that he gets um, and uh, is always thrown out, often beaten up, but every, every day he's thrown out eventually by by somebody or another. He has 12 children, uh, the eldest of which is, uh, is 15 and goes right down to, a, to a, a young baby. And they live in one room, uh, no, of course, sanitation of any kind. If you want to go to the lavatory, you go to uh, a, uh, a building site, bomb site actually from the, from the Civil War uh, opposite, uh, along with quite a lot of other people. No water or anything like that. And the man has no money at all, uh, and um, it's always a pleasure to go and see, because he's a thoughtful and intelligent person, and I base a lot of what I think about, and I suppose broadcast about Afghanistan, from what, from what Muhammad Khan tell, tells me, and how he feels things are going, and which direction it's going, and who are the bad guys, and who are the good guys, and so forth. He's surprisingly intelligent, and I tell you, I, I, I was, uh, you know, I don't really believe in uh, tear-jerking stuff uh, as a sort of implement of, of employ my employment, but to see the elder children um, teaching and reading and teaching the younger children at night time is, uh, is a very affecting sight, and uh, how proud they are to be able to read and write. And those are the kind of things that I, I feel that Oxfam understands better than just about any, anybody else. It understands that the nature of Afghanistan, the way that it's run, uh, decides the lives of people like Muhammad Khan and his, and his children, wife and children. And it isn't just about feeding hungry babies with uh, flies settling on their eyes. That has to be done with huge importance. That's, that's, uh, that's an urgent duty for us. But it isn't the only duty. And the thing that really gives me such pleasure about uh, being allowed to be here tonight is to be able to give the credit to, to, to Oxfam for understanding what is really needed, that you have to help a society up bit by bit by bit by bit, until the, the Mohammed Khans are, well, just able to lead normal lives instead of 
surprised and, and bitter by it. So that's the story that I, I feel it, it's my job to tell, our job to tell, but it's also the story that I know that Oxfam has to tell. And so I just want to say thank you so much for turning out tonight. And you've done it, I have to say, in a, in a very good cause indeed. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.